I'm delighted to be guest hosting this episode for the International Curriculum Association, where we meet a senior leader at an eminent international school in the UAE to discuss a range of pertinent topics in the sector, including practical advice for maintaining a work-life balance, professional development opportunities more broadly, how to effectively transition to a new country, and much more. Hopefully this episode might help existing teachers and leaders in the international sector, or even those looking to move overseas to an international school in the near future. Therefore, delighted to be joined by Martin, Martin Butha, for this discussion. Martin's an assistant head at GEMS Metropole School in the UAE. Uh, welcome, Martin. Great to have you on this, on, this, on this podcast. Thank you very much, Max. Great to be here. Brilliant. So we'll just kick, kick straight off. Um, and yeah, a bit about, bit about yourself, really. Can you tell me a bit about your, your position, um, your school uh, you're currently at, and a bit about your journey into teaching and, and now leadership? Um, well, I suppose we'll sort of start with that, really, I suppose. I mean, um, I've uh, my background initially was in EAL. Um, I trained as an EAL teacher many, many, many years ago, uh, worked in a few places around the world. Um, but there came a point where I decided there wasn't enough money in it. Um, I needed to, I wanted to get into state teaching in the UK and I'm a linguist. So I thought, well, being a, a language and MFL teacher is probably the way forward. So I studied at Exeter University, um, you know, qualified, started work in Devon. Uh, and, and then before too long, I was um, headhunted for head of department role in a new school, uh, a studio school that had opened up, which I loved. Um, it was a great job, lovely people, um, great students, uh, lots of challenges because it was a new school. Um, but at the same time, I was being a bit disillusioned with what was happening with my own children's education. Hence, eventually, my, my wife and I made the decision that uh, international teaching was the way forward. So uh, so we set off on our adventures and it's uh, starting in, uh, well, in a couple of weeks time, it will be my 10th year abroad. Um, and I've gone from from head of department to associate assistant principal to currently this will be my fourth year as a assistant head uh, at GEMS Metropole in Dubai. Uh, it's a great school. Um, you know, it's a huge school. Uh, I think we're going to be around 4,150 students uh, this upcoming year, which is uh, an awful lot. Uh, but there's a lot of really good people there, um, good, good teachers, good leadership team, uh, some lovely, lovely, uh, you know, students. Uh, and I've got to know lots of the families. So it's a, a school that I think does a lot of things very very well no school's perfect there are things we need to improve as, as the same with every school but we do do a lot of things very well and we're definitely an improving school um with you know lofty ambitions to sort of see how how far we can go on that on that road to improvement hmm, fantastic and, and just out of interest you know in terms of the staff um sort of nationality split is it is it quite a um a sort of international teaching teaching staff base you have um the majority of staff are british um, and obviously, because in the UAE, uh, it's a legal requirement to teach Arabic and Islamic. So all of our Arabic and Islamic teachers are from uh, other sort of Arabic countries. So we don't have a single British member of staff teaching Arabic or Islamic. They're all, but no Emiratis uh, teaching, but they're from other countries, Egypt, Jordan, places like that. Um, we do have a few South African teachers. We've got a lovely uh, a lady uh, from North Africa who teaches uh, computer science. Um, uh, we used to have an amazing Australian lady, but yeah, the majority of us uh, are, are British or at the very least British trained. OK, interesting. Brilliant. Yeah. And I mean, in terms of that sort of more more international multicultural background of staff members that you do naturally get at international schools. Can you tell me a bit about some of these unique challenges that the international schools may face in terms of the well-being element um, for, for staff and also obviously students? Um compared to more traditional domestic schools is there a bit of a is there a bit of a mix and, and dynamic between between the two do you think i mean i think in terms of the st uh, the, the staff well-being yes to to a point in terms of uh, the fact that there will be members of staff from other um other countries whereas if you're working in a school in the uk the majority of teachers are going to be british you know you might have you know it might be a french national teaching french or a spanish national teaching spanish but overall most people are british Whereas we do have, I say, lots of us are British, quite a few Irish um, from the Republic of Ireland. But then, of course, we have all of our um, Arabic staff teaching Arabic and Islamic. And I, it, sometimes it's a simple thing as, you know, as um, a, a little thing at Christmas, for example, I tend to make mince pies. I make my own mince meat. I make mince pies, bring them in. And then as I was about to bring them in, my wife reminded me, he's like, you can't bring them in. I was like, why not? It's like, because you used rum. And it, Oh, of course. And it's just little things like that you just have to be aware of. And it's not it's not a um, no one does anything, you know, intentionally to, to offend or, or to 
go you know go against someone else's culture but it's little things you don't think about i hadn't thought about it i always make my own mincemeat i always put rum in it and it was one of those little things um and again on staff socials you need to make sure that uh you don't do a staff social event where the school for example says we'll pay for the drinks because then the the people who are the muslims at least and obviously there'll be British people that don't drink as well, but the Muslims, for example, can't partake in that. So you have to make sure you're doing events such as the staff. We will subsidize X amount of money everyone spends, for example, and then staff can spend that money whenever they see fit. So you, you just have to be a little bit culturally aware. Um, I think for the students, it's probably more of an issue because they, we have over 100 nationalities uh, and you know they're from countries from all over the place. So you just have to be aware that you are making them feel valued, making them uh, understand that you do value their country, their culture. And even if you only have one person from that country, that's just as important as if you have 200 from, from another country. You know, everyone's culture and countries is equally uh, valuable. And mm -hmm. I think as long as the school's aware of that, and obviously the international schools, the things we, we have International Day, which is possibly the biggest event on the calendar, is my favourite day of the year. Uh, that's when you can really celebrate the the culture. But, you know, we, we do little things such as, you know, um, 1st of November, we celebrate Mexican Day of the Dead at the beginning of the school. We'll celebrate different countries, Independence Days, Diwali, obviously Ramadan and Eid. And all of the events that are important to different cultures, we try and uh, make sure that the students re and the families know that we're aware of these days and their significance and, you know, give a little shout out where where possible. Really interesting. And it just, that, it just out of interest, you know, for those listening that might be um, new to teaching or even, you know, looking to, to, to move internationally and are new to that sort of thinking um, and have never done it before. How, how might you learn about, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, you're a leader, leader in the international school in the UAE. Um, how did you learn about everyone's cultural differences? Was it an open conversation with staff or um, yeah. How, how might one approach that that's new to the international environment to understand uh, all the different cultural sensitivities? Uh, of I, I think I mean, it's a good question. And I think it, it depends a lot on the school. School. Um, we, I think we've been quite fortunate here and I was actually equally very fortunate in my previous schools. I worked in Shanghai mm. um, and the staff, the existing staff were very good at it. And um, I remember in Shanghai, the teachers sat down, um, some of the Chinese staff sat down just to explain some of the differences. And they said, look, we're not going to get offended if you say or do the wrong thing because we realize you don't understand. Or if you have a question, don't worry uh it's not something that we'll be offended by we'll be happy to answer that question but here is a general overview so they give you a little overview of the culture and we try and do that here for new staff as well so our head of arabic and islamic he will give us sort of an overview to new staff about what's appropriate in, in a muslim country and what's not and obviously most of the staff aren't muslim so being british obviously we're a multicultural society here so there are things you do know but there'll be other things that you're completely unaware of um and again, the staff here are very open to hearing those sort of questions and not taking offence. Uh, so you haven't got that awkward, do I ask, do I not ask? You just go ahead and ask. Uh, and then people will tell you. And I think people are appreciative of that. If you're if you're showing that you, you're asking the question because you want to know, because you want to make sure you're not being offensive or that you're you know not making the wrong decision, people are accepting of that. I think it's worse if you're a bit, if you're afraid to ask and keep it to yourself you're more likely to make those sort of cultural faux pas that no one wants to make. And, and yes, from time to time, you will. You know, you're going to say something wrong at one point or do something wrong at one point. And, you know, as long as you're open with it after, so look, I didn't realise people don't get offended. You know, they, they, it's the good intentions are, are what counts. Yeah, yeah. I suppose, yeah, approaching it with curiosity is, is yeah. the main element, right? Yeah, yeah. And in terms of, you know, work-life balance, um, again, for those that maybe have not worked in international school that are listening, um, you know, what does that look like? And what, what strategies can international schools um, implement to promote a healthy work-life balance for, for their staff? Um, yeah. And what, what does that look like in, in your school? Well, we, we're actually doing quite a lot of work on that because as, as with any school, I mean, teachers are, are very dedicated professionals and, and we all take it very seriously and we take it to heart. If a lesson's not good enough, it, it, it bugs us. You know, we want to make, you know, why did that lesson not work? And I know when I was in, um, early in my, in my career, I would spend maybe half an hour, 45 minutes on Google Images just finding the right picture for a PowerPoint. Now, of course, as you get a bit more experience, you realise that that's a complete and utter waste of my time. <laughs> Um, but it's because of that perfectionism. You want to be, you know, to be as good as you can. So we do things such as we we tell staff, for example, WhatsApp is used a lot in the UAE. 
Uh, that's one of the pre premium sort of modes of communication. We say, look, work-based WhatsApps need to finish by a certain time. So you shouldn't be sending work-based WhatsApps. Mm -hmm. If you have emails, try to put the uh, delay send and schedule the send for the next day, uh, unless it's absolutely vital. Um, we don't make staff stay on site longer than necessary at the end of the day. All staff, uh, we have PD once a week. It's a Tuesday and staff know that. That's not going to change unless... For example, we have a parents' evening one night in which goes we might cancel the PD to sort of counteract the the extra time staff are giving. But they know that that's the day they stay a bit later. But the other days, they can leave, and they can leave, you know, not as soon as the students leave, but very very soon after, because we trust that they're going to get the work done. I know there are some schools that say students leave at three thirty, but you're staying until four thirty at least. Then you sort of say, well, why? You know, they're going to get the work done. If, you, if I employ someone, it's because I trust them. Um, and then, of course, you know, the relationship you build with your staff, you, you hopefully end up that trust in is well founded and they've become great teachers, great colleagues. So we give them that time. Um, we have our PE department are wonderful that we'll have before school, uh, swimming before school, fitness things after school, uh, different fitness things going on as well. So staff can get involved in that. All the departments are very good at having social events. I've sort of been adopted uh, by the MFL department since I used to used to lead MFL department. So I've been on several of their social events. Um, and it's just that the school really encourages you socialising with staff, making time. And then if we have to take staff's time after school because of, like I said, a PD or a parent's evening or, or something, we try and give it back where possible because we acknowledge that people are giving up their time and they need time to relax, to unwind. Um, it's just that period around inspection where things get a bit stressful and staff work a bit longer. But again, afterwards, we try and thank staff and have a social to, kind of, um, to sort of thank them and to try and give back that time where possible. So a mm -hmm. bit of give and take. But we are very conscious of the fact that teaching is a very, very high pressure uh, profession and we need to make sure staff are looking after themselves. So we don't want them in work, you know, from six o'clock every day until five o'clock in the in the evening. It's not necessary and it's not healthy. Mm. it's really nice to hear that you give that time back to them as well i imagine because the yeah like you said the stresses and strains on teachers and senior leaders uh, international school any any school for that matter is yeah. just so immense isn't it and to recognize that um you know you need to intentionally give them that time for their own well-being to to free that time up for them um, and sometimes they need to be told that right because sometimes you know they take on too much and, and don't know when to say no and and, and they sort of need exactly to... and, and from a school's point of view i mean lots of our lots of our teachers have families uh you know quite young families most of them I think I'm, I'm more the, the exception because my children my son's just finished his first year at uni my daughter will be going into year 11 next year so I've got a slightly older family but lots of them have young families and I'd be honest I wouldn't trust any member of staff that puts their job before their family uh, I would want them to put their family first you know if their kids have a um, an assembly or a celebration that you, I want them to go to it and we want to try and make sure you can you know get cover in place or let them leave early one day and you've got to put your family first and I think we, we try to encourage that and make it possible for staff to do that and like I said if you're if you've got the family life sorted you're going to be more productive at work anyway which is beneficial for for us as, as school leaders but it's beneficial for the students who are obviously uh, the important people at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah. You're looking after the whole person, right? Instead of yeah. just an element of them. Yeah, brilliant. And in terms of the professional development, we, we touched on that. Um, be ready to go into that in a bit bit more depth. So obviously, international educators may have different needs for professional development and, and mm -hmm. support compared to their their counterparts. Um, so what what specific resources and, and programs can international schools or have, have you perhaps done in, in your schools? Um, you know, what can you offer to enhance staff well-being and professional growth more broadly? I think the, the the opportunities in international education for progression and professional growth is huge. Uh, I think possibly more so than in the UK. We don't have necessarily the same budgetary constraints that schools do, you know, in the UK, where you know your funding is controlled by the local council and uh, or the number of students you have. But because it's all state education, there's not as much money coming into it. Mm. We're fortunate in that, say, we were a large school, um, so because of that, we do have quite a large PD budget, uh, and we do look to encourage staff to do as many different courses as they can that are beneficial. Now that could be going on the latest, I don't know, Pearson Ed Excel, uh, new mathematics spec for GCSE course, for example, or it could be to be an examiner, um, or it could be one of the, the new MPQMLs uh, that are coming out, um, or to any anything like that. And it's more a case of speaking to each member of staff. Each member of staff should be speaking with their line manager 
Uh, and in those line management meetings, one of the topics of conversation should be career. You know, what do you, where do you see yourself in five or eight, 10 years time? And as a school, how can we help you get there? Mm -hmm. um, and I was fortunate enough, my school paid for me to do the MPQSL. Um, I'm looking to possibly do the um, MPQH in the near future. Um, and again, the school are prepared to, to support with that for time, but also most schools are prepared to, to support you financially, whether it being that you then have to commit to X number of years at the school if they pay for it. But that, that I think is, is fair. Um, I think the only thing that some international schools don't quite get right um, is when they offer their own bespoke training. Um, now, I've worked for uh, Nord Anglia, another large school group, and nothing bad to say about them. They were phenomenal employers. Uh, the only thing that I thought wasn't quite as useful is that I did the Nord Anglia version of the MPQ ML. I loved the course. It was really useful. I met some amazing people. I thought I got a lot out of it. But if I want to go back into state teaching in the UK or around to, you know, to other countries outside and any group outside of Nord Anglia, that qualification isn't really valued because it's not the standard MPQML. It's the Nord Anglia internal version. And I think that's the slight thing that, that staff need to be aware of through, say, at GEMS, I've done the standard MPQSL. So wherever I go internationally or back in the UK, it's recognised. And I think that's the thing that you have to just be careful of is if it's a, a big course that you want to do to progress your career, it's important to make sure it is an internationally recognised one. Whereas if you're just doing courses to improve your practice in a certain area or something like that, then, of course, anything internal, external, it doesn't matter. It's all valuable. So I think that that's one thing I would say to staff need to, need to look out for. But there are so many opportunities um, and schools really do encourage uh, encourage staff to go on these courses to get training to get experience and to progress their careers uh, and would you say that these these kind of conversations you know understanding it's a fantastic point about those um, internal qualifications and obviously external externally internationally recognized qualifications would you say that's something that you know interviewer interviewees must ask their their, their future employer as to what that looks like what does professional development look like in in the school that they may be joining um, i think that's a hugely important question i mean it, it obviously it depends everyone's different there are some people who just want to be classroom teachers and that's nothing wrong with that whatsoever mm -hmm. um i've known some phenomenal teachers um who just want to teach and they're incredible and you know the students are so fortunate to have them but lots of people are, are more ambitious and want to move up the chain and getting into the head of department, SLT, you know, higher than that, executive heads, that sort of thing. And if that's what you're aiming at, I think it is vital that you do an interview, ask what PD looks like, what's available, how do I do it? Will the school support me both financially and with time? Um, and if in an interview you get the impression that the school's not really interested in professional development, I probably say that's not the right school mm. for you. I mean, I've been fortunate. I've never had that um, that feeling in any of my interviews and the schools I've worked at, say both North Anglia in China, I worked for Aldar, which is a UAE based company and now GEMS have all been very, very proactive and very forward thinking with um, with PD, what they're prepared to offer to staff. But it is definitely a question you, ne you need to ask because you don't want to end up on a two year contract at a school where, you're not going to develop and they're not going to support your development. Yeah, yeah, that's an excellent point. I think for any anyone that is listening that is looking at, at the international arena, obviously there's so many, what are they, closing in on 14, maybe 15,000 international schools. It's incredible how many yeah. schools, yeah. It's incredible. And and obviously you've got a few of the, the big boys that they're doing incredibly well. Um, and obviously there's lots of middle tier ones and new ones that are starting. So, um, you know, if you're not quite sure of the brand name or they maybe aren't, aren't sort of, um, you know, they don't have that sort of legacy brand to, to bring with them and that awareness that that you might already know what what, what they're all about. Um, it's really important to ask those questions at the beginning, isn't it? Before you, it is. before you go. And also them. not just not just look at the, the brand name, so to speak. I mean, I've, you know, I've gone shopping and bought myself a plain white T-shirt with a little Nike tick on it before. I've also bought a plain white t-shirt from Sainsbury's and mm. they've both been equally good yeah. uh you know so the name doesn't necessarily mean yeah. anything from a teaching point of view I know for parents it can uh it can be reassuring but um I would argue there are some amazing schools that are with well-known names um in the gems network for example but there are also amazing schools that are individual independent you know standalone schools and there'll probably be some schools with big names that are not run as well as they used to be run, maybe. Um, so it's about, you know, just getting the right feeling for the school, making sure that the people that you're interviewing, they're interviewing you, 
give across the right vibe because interviews work both ways they're interviewing you but you're interviewing them as well yeah couldn't could not agree more yeah yeah and in terms of you know f- potential isolation that you know that you might that might have if if you're moving from maybe the UK or to the UE for the first time or to America or Southeast Asia uh, and you maybe haven't lived abroad much before um, you know feeling isolated from loved ones and family uh, yeah. you know, familial uh, support networks can can be a real stressor can't they for international school staff at it's, times. So, I I think this is one of the biggest challenges uh, yeah. and there are some people that are better at it than others. Um, you need to be open minded to the fact that for the first few months, you quite pos- well, when that first initial honeymoon period of, of um, excitement, meeting new people, getting used to where you live, you know, that will take a few weeks, a month, maybe. But when that what wears off, there is going to be a period of uncertainty or of, of homesickness. Um, if you've got kids, it can be really challenging because your kids are missing their friends and they might struggle. To- I mean, some kids fit in straight away. But other kids, it takes them longer. And then as a parent, you feel guilty. Uh, did I make the right decision? Um, and you don't have the support network you had. You know, I mean, I I have never had that support network of being able to have my mum or my dad or my wife's parents look after our kids as they're growing up. But I want to go out for a meal with my wife on Valentine's Day, but there's no one to look after my kids because uh, I'm not in the UK. Um, you have to be aware of that. But at the same time, schools should do as much as they can to sort of mitigate that. I know at my current school, we have an online induction that goes on. I think from several months before staff land in Dubai, Mm. they have four or five online sessions. We talk about the culture, talk about the school, you get to know each other, you meet senior leaders. So at the very least, when staff arrive, they actually have an idea of who the other new staff are. They know who some of the leaders are, they know about the country. And then we organize a series of sort of social events for new staff in the first couple of weeks and then heads of department and their SLT sort of line leaders are checking in regularly. You know, are you OK? Can I help you? Anything you need? Um, and I, say, I always have that conversation with people that I line in. I'm always my first question and every any every line leading management um, line leader meeting. I can't speak English today uh, that we have. The first question is, how are you? How is your team? anything I can do to help, you know, in terms of well-being and little little conversation in the corridor. And if someone's off sick, it's really important that people are messaging them. So if one of my team's off sick, I'll message, how are you? Do you need anything? Do you need me to pop round to to your house to, you know, how sick are you? Do you want me to do your shopping for you? Or, and I just think it's important as as leaders to make sure that you are constantly thinking about the well-being of the staff. And I think it's important that staff are aware that they might have this period of uncertainty but as someone who's going into his 10th year abroad, and my daughter, for example, she started in year two. She's now going into year 11. Um, it's the best decision I've ever made. Mm. Hands down, the best decision I made. The opportunities my children have had, the things they've seen and done, the things, how they've learned, um, how they've grown as individuals. Um, it is the best decision. But yes, there have been times along the way where I've questioned it. I've been worried. Um, I felt lonely from time to time. But if you surround yourself with the right people and and you've got those people in these schools because everyone's in a similar situation, then it does all turn out right in the end. Mm, Yeah. And just you touched on your on your your kids. there having that international uh, education uh, themselves. You know, what would you say are the biggest um, biggest positive elements for for, for giving your kids that that international exposure at an early age? Um, In terms of the fact that we're living in a multicultural society, uh, a very international world anyway now, they do become true global citizens. Um, And I remember, you know, if my daughter has friends around for a party, for example, there might be 10 10 teenage girls in my house, every single one of them from a different country, Mm. from different cultures, and they're all getting on and they don't care what... uh, what the gender of someone is, what their ethnicity is, the colour of their skin, their their religion, they don't care. They've just got to know each other as individuals where everyone is different therefore in a way everyone's the same um and i think that's brilliant and i think that's only going to help foster you know kindness and happiness and more sort of people being integrated better in in the future and all these children at international schools i think have got a much better opportunity to be you know leaders in whatever field they they go into but to really understand that that multiculturalism that that the fact that our differences don't have to be viewed negatively I think that in itself is amazing. And then if you're coming from the UK, I don't worry about crime 
I don't worry about my kids getting into fights. I don't worry about anything dangerous happening to them. And that's, I get paranoid when I come back to the UK. Mm. Ridiculously so. There's no need to really. But they've grown up in a safe environment where they're, they can just be kids. They can go out and enjoy themselves and do harmless things. And there's no danger. And in the majority of countries that, that I've worked, all the countries I've worked in, that's been the case. Mm. So I think as a parent, the safety that my kids have, have had and the the way they've been able to meet people from different cultures and properly become friends with all these different people, I think that's the most uh, the most valuable thing they've got out of it. And that leads me perfectly onto my sort of last question here about sort of re-entry and transition from maybe working in the UAE for a number of years, 10 years, and then maybe if you wanted to come back to the UK, how might schools and especially, you know, how does your school um, deal with that in terms of, of, of making staff um, sort of re-enter their home countries or another country, transition to another country effectively, comfortably? You know, what resources and support systems can international schools or have, have your school put in place to help help staff navigate this? I mean, you, you do what you can. I think it's it's quite challenging because theoretically staff could be moving on from us to to anywhere in the world. So there's, there's very little that you can do that's that's generic. Um, I think what you try and do is make sure that um, based on what we know as leaders, you need to do to start life in the UAE. It's a case of, right, wherever you're going, you're going to need similar type things. Have you thought about X, Y and Z? You know, are, have you made decisions yet upon... You know, do you have a choice of apartment or, or villa? Have you thought about location, distance from the school? Do you have your own accommodations provided or are you going to choose? In which case, you know, do you need any advice on that? Um, and then, of course, in terms of when they have children, we just try and make it as, as easy as possible for all the school records and transcripts and stuff to go through. And of course, if you're moving from a or from us, we're a British curriculum school to another British curriculum school. Well, it's very, very, very simple. The only slight uh, difficulties come as if you're moving to IB curriculum or American curriculum or Canadian, then of course, it's a case of us trying to help make sure the transcripts go through that the other schools understand where the children are uh, to make sure there's no disadvantage for the child. Um, I think one of the things that has been an issue in the past, I think things are improving based on, on, on some of my contacts, but is moving back to the UK has sometimes been challenging uh, because some UK school leaders used to at least have the impression that working abroad was a bit of a jolly. You're on a holiday, you don't work very hard, you're not up to date with the latest uh, pedagogical uh, techniques and strategies, and, and nothing could be further from the truth. I've never worked as hard as I do in Dubai. Um, it's much more high pressure. So it's not a holiday, but you've just got the benefit of once you finish work, you've got better weather and more facilities. Um, that that is now changing, but we do make sure, for example, on, on references to really highlight the skills that our, our staff have, um, the abilities they have, the, the similarities, because obviously it's the same curriculum, uh, to make sure that there are no people with those sort of old fashioned attitudes of the fact that, well, I don't really want to hire this person who's been in the UAE for five years. He probably hasn't even been teaching because uh, really nothing could be further from the truth. That's a very interesting point, that one, isn't it? Because, uh, yeah, I mean, I've had hundreds and maybe even thousands of conversations with the school leaders outside of the, of the UK, but also some within the UK. And that is that is a mindset shift that I think potentially, hopefully, is changing. Because, like you said, it couldn't be further than the truth, right? Even maybe the opposite is the case, that you've been able to try things, you've been able to give the freedom and the, you know potentially the resources to, to try things and sort of advance your own professional development in a, in a way that you may not have had the opportunity to in the UK. So, um, And then also, we're so culturally diverse in the UK, what better yeah. teacher that could you have than someone coming into your school who yeah. has worked with children from all over the world and is probably more culturally aware than staff that have never left the UK just because of their life experiences. So, no, I think anyone who's worked abroad for a decent amount of time coming back into the UK would be a huge asset to, uh, to any school um, in the UK. Thank you so much, Martin. That was, that was absolutely fascinating. And yeah, such <laughs> invaluable insights. And, and I'm sure we carry on this conversation for many more hours but um yeah we'll have to leave it there but yeah we'll um, I'd love to attach your, your email martin you know at the bottom of the description if anyone does want to ask any questions about yeah you know, of course your life or it'd be great to, for people to maybe get in touch with you um and we're also putting um ica's uh, free professional development hub uh link uh for, for teachers as well which is which is absolutely fantastic so yeah well worth signing up for like i said completely free um yeah thank you once again martin absolutely fascinating no no thank you been a pleasure brilliant thanks martin okay take care